Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our discussion on emancipatory technology in the context of the Impact Summit called DOTS. I am Aleph Kurban from the Goethe University Frankfurt and the Center of Emancipatory Technology Studies, and I'm very happy to host this session today. Three technology experts agreed to share, share their knowledge with us and discuss if technologies can be emancipatory and if yes, from what oppressions do they act emancipatory? So welcome Georgia, Chinmai and Linda. Uh, Georgia is a Brazilian activist, co-founder and one of the directors of Instituto Pro Comum, a commons based organization based in Brazil. Instituto Pro Comum is a nonprofit organization that rethinks the role of free culture organizations in the face of digital transformation. In this vein, the Institute members protect commons and community arrangements and thus prevent enclosure by private and state action. And Chinmai is a technologist and researcher from India. She's the founder of the Bachao project, which works on the issues of women and LGBTQIA communities. Chinmai has a decade of experience in working on issues of technology and gender. For example, she conducts interdisciplinary feminist research and create spaces for dialogue. And Linda Bonio is the founding director at Africa Law Tech and the CEO of Lawyers Hub in Kenya, working on the confluence of law and technology. And driven by the need for sustainable and inclusive tech policy across the African continent, the Lawyers Hub, for example, brings together policymakers and prime movers from 20 plus countries to discuss and develop policies on data and elections, artificial intelligence, digital tax and digital identity. So before we delve into the discussion, I will briefly explain why we are interested in the topic of emancipatory technologies. And then Chinmai, Georgia and Linda have five minutes each to present how they see emancipatory technology in their context and in their work. And after that, we go into the discussion. So the discourses on tech for good, social impact and technology for development celebrate technologies as solutions to manifold problems. Farmers should be better included in the global market through mobile phone apps. Children should be better educated through digital devices and pregnant women should gain better health care with digital diagnostic tools. But besides these promising effects of technologies, Critics claim that structural problems like, for example, an insufficient healthcare system cannot be solved by so-called technological fixes. So therefore, we are confronted with the question of what technologies are able to do and what not. So are technologies able to act emancipatory or not? And in this conversation today, we want to share our experiences in the technology sector of different con countries and different continents to highlight the diverse fights that have to be fought for. So for example, decolonialism, legal justice, diversity, better infrastructures. And additionally, our experts give insights into the multiple functions of tech as being emancipatory, but also oppressive or both at the same time. So as a start, I would like to invite uh, our discussants to present their take on emancipatory tech in their work. And I would ask Georgia, to start. Uh, Procomon was uh, created in 2016 and uh, a lot of us um, were connected to the free software movement in Brazil, uh, but also connected to the cultural policy movement and uh, the value of our cultural diversity, which had another meaning by that time. Um, in 2003, when Lula was elected president of Brazil uh, from the Workers' Party, he chose uh, as Minister of Culture Gilberto Gil, who is a really uh, famous singer as well as a uh, thinker. Um, and Gilberto Gil, uh, as Minister of Culture, he uh, self-claimed himself, he called himself as a hacker ministry. And what that meant is that uh, he understood technology as something that would be not just emancipating, but also uh, making it even more, more strong the uh, Brazilian creativity and diversity, specifically the, the, the coming from the margins. So Brazil is a continental country, 
and we have a lot of uh, countries in one. And um, one of his main uh, policies was Pontos de Cultura, so cultural dots, which was um, a cultural policy that was really innovative uh, and that influenced a lot of other uh, countries and thinkers that was, he would call that a, a anthropological doing. So coming from below to above. Uh, so instead of creating cultural centers or physical spaces and infrastructures, why don't we just potentialize what is already in the territories, you know, and, uh, and um, to these cultural dots, uh, that was uh, things that were already existing, you know, manifestations, ancestrality, technologies that will have been developed. Um, they, we added the layer of free culture. So there was digital culture kits, all based in free software so that people could produce and upload, not just download and share uh, content and technology. So this is kind of the thinking that came from Fracomun and also understanding that the state was unable to deal with it because um, the bureaucratic uh, way of dealing with this kind of arrangements of community based arrangements could uh, also led to a lot of them to be, you know, um, in bad terms because of the whole bureaucracy thing. So um, I'm just going to share a quick video uh, from one of our uh, also associate founders. Uh, she's not part of the team, but she's a counselor and she also has been part of all this movement with us. And I think she, she brings some good points for us to question. What do we understand when we're saying technology? Uh, so I think it's nice to speak about emancipatory tech, but also what is tech? What, what, what is it made for? Who invents tech? Who is innovative and who is not? And what kind of solutions are we talking about to, to address what needs for whom? So let me share here. Just a minute. Comum diz que é feito a bens partilhados por uma determinada comunidade. E eu olho para o comum da perspectiva do povo negro, que sempre esteve apartado do Estado e do capital. Então, o Brasil é um país que teve quase 400 anos de escravidão. E depois dessa situação de violência extrema e de expropriação de tudo, a abolição que muita gente fala de falsa abolição, não estabeleceu condições para que essas pessoas participassem da sociedade. Pelo contrário, a política do Estado brasileiro sempre foi de extermínio. Mas como é que a gente está viva, né? A gente é 54% da população. Se a política de Estado é uma política de extermínio, é porque a gente partilha aquilo que a gente tem. Mas é uma partilha especialmente do axé, da energia vital, da espiritualidade. A gente normalmente fala dos quilombos como a associação de pessoas negras que fugiram da condição de escravizadas no passado. Mas o quilombo permanece como possibilidade de existência, como um mundo possível. Os quilombos do período colonial eram agrupamentos muito sólidos que recebiam também pessoas indígenas, pessoas brancas pobres, recebiam pessoas em condição de, mar de marginalidade numa sociedade mais inclusiva. Tem quilombo onde as pessoas negras se reúnem e criam condições para sua própria existência. Sempre aberta à interação e a receber outras pessoas que estejam à margem dessa sociedade que sempre nos excluiu. Então é por aí que eu olho o comum. O comum não tem uma dimensão racional, linear. Pelo contrário, diz respeito à vida das pessoas e à complexidade da nossa vida em comunidade. Yeah, um, so I liked this video a lot because I think it tells about ex um, existence and the premises where we are looking when we're speaking about technology. So we do have at Procomum a lab, as what we call Citizen Innovation Lab. There is a hacker space there, there is a maker space there, but there's also an artistic residency, a permaculture lab, a medicinal plant uh, space, a cure uh, and, and lab. We also have a project of uh, memory and ancestrality and um, just wait because I think the video.
that. And, um, and I think uh, it's important to say that what we call you know, citizen innovation, uh, what we defend is that people that are living the problems, embodying the problems, are the ones that have the solution. And the question that Bianca makes is, how are we still alive? when she's asking and when she's giving the context of uh, enslaved and black people uh, uh, in Brazil, is because they create technologies every day. They create technologies. And this is what I, I, I understand as emancipatory tech, is that how can we work as an ecosystem to uh, value and put this, this kind of inventions, innovative solutions on the spot. This is what I call uh, when, I, when I think about innovation and innovative people, I think about these people that are creating solutions every day, despite the market or the state. And, uh, and, and it's everywhere, right? And um, so at Procomun, uh, we, we, we are a experimental lab, we prototype solutions, so we have also a 3D printer, but it's not about that. This, we, we say that technology is grass, so it's about creating solutions to life in community so that people can be self-determined and uh, that we can have a, a egalitarian um, uh, perspective, right? And I think what uh, uh, bothers me the most about, you know, tech, uh, the tech discourse coming from Silicon Valley is that it's not talking about the roots of the inequalities. You know, we've seen that inequality has just been bigger and bigger throughout the years, even though we are producing more and more wealth. So how is this possible? And I think technology is playing a big role on this, in this divide that is not only digital, not only, it's, it's, it's before that, it's beyond that. It's a social divide and it's not getting any better. So that's, that would be my first takes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we ask you many questions, <laughs> we go on to Shin Mai's introduction. And I will share her yeah, screen. Hey, um, would you be kind enough to go to the second screen? I can start from there. OK. Um, when we think about emancipatory technologies, this is the definition, right? Technologies that allows us to free ourselves. Um, any freedom will come if we can speak uh, ourselves, speak, if we are free to speak and we are able to speak about our experiences, we are able to uh, label our experiences and share them to the world. So that's what I feel about uh, the power of a technology being emancipatory. I started out as a free software um, technologist, advocate, um, and it's been 10 years or actually over a decade, no, more than a decade, that I started working with the idea and notion that technology would free us, would provide us the rights, would make us more uh, vocal and in a way also be more democratic. So that's how I started as a free technology, free software technologist. And then um, over the years, um, I started working with communities. Uh, I started working with building technology with communities, understanding uh, their needs and also building from my own perspective as a woman, uh, as a person uh, who is um, a, called queer. And I started seeing uh, this world from my lens. Uh, I started supporting other people from uh, this lens too. Um, in that moment, I also believed in like building for technology for good. To now, I am a researcher who is looking at what difference has technology made? How much is it freeing us? How much it's not freeing us? Um, not exactly under the name, label of emancipatory technology, but in under different labels of like say, internet freedom, censorship. So that's what my journey has been. So I started with at most optimism to now where I am, 
feeling 50-50 about this, where I'm in the gray. So that's where I am. Um, it was great when I started out. I had so much optimism because it was the technology uh, community which was uh, growing then. Um, in the 90s, uh, India opened up its economy which meant the technology sector in India grew, bloomed, uh, created a lot of technologies, also brought in our optimism with it, which is also uh, somewhere I realized blind optimism with it. Um, we had this hope of creating technology, which uh, maybe our community or our friends or family would use. Um, and then, would change our lives. It did change a lot of lives, but it also brought in a lot of inequality. So that's how I've seen technology to now, where we are at a stage where technologists in this country uh, are appropriating a lot of things, including like what is open source. Uh, they are uh, involved in building all the stacks and monitoring citizens, um, building surveillance systems, and do it under the name of technology for good. So pardon me if I went from highly optimistic to like very pessimistic when I think about emancipatory technologies. Uh, could we go to the next slide? So for me now, India has two worlds. Um, the two worlds, um, I'll let the next slide, please. So the two worlds that India has is one is where there are a bunch of technologists who are working on something like software that software or technology which would establish like signal with uh, and satellite on the moon and like and on the other hand there is a part of my country which does not have access to internet. Um, this access to internet, though we are a country where we have 50% penetration in mobile internet, which means um, out of 100 people, at least 50 people have connections. Uh, and we have around 680 million connections. Um, so which is a lot of connections, uh, internet connections. But a lot of these people cannot access internet because either there's no infrastructure or there is an internet blockade somewhere. We are a country with the highest number of internet shutdowns. This is close to 500 internet shutdowns at this point. So I'm in the same state as my country in two worlds. One where I am looking forward to the newest uh, the next technology that's out there, but I'm also aware, aware of all the um, issues that technology itself brings in and thinking about, is it really emancipatory? Is it helping us free ourselves? Is it helping us speak? Or is it something that is pulling us back? That's where I am at. Thank you very much tonight for your take and insights. Uh, Linda, would you go next, please? Thank you very much. And um, I would like to speak to I would like to speak to, you know, what what this means for you know, for the legal profession and the intersection between law um, and technology. So just give me a minute. Okay. So um, I would like to speak to what this means for law and technology in this sense. Um, and uh, the role of technology in enhancing the emancipatory potential of the law in Africa. Um, to, you know, to to look at what you know, law can do and what tech can do and what bo they both cannot be able to achieve um, is important. And so I'm going to just take you through this presentation. Um, so next slide, please. 
So these are comments um, from a professor who said that the hope for laws facilitation of real social transformation and more social justice have often been disappointed, leading to deep frustration and political backlash. And as a result, the prospects for laws emancipatory potential today appear dim. Those are the words of Professor Bonaventura de Sosa Santos. Sorry if I massacred the name, um, but I'm not able to really pronounce it well. But I think many times we, we hope that the law would be able to, you know, technology would be able to fix certain things and it's not able to. And so within the justice sector, next slide, we realize um, that there are several ways in which, you know, um, technology has enhanced the emancipa emancipation through the law. Um, so with technology, we have better access to information and we have more countries coming up now with access to information laws. We also have access to justice where now you have, you know, um, more people accessing courts. At the Lawyers Hub in Africa Law Tech, we recently did, um, you know, we recently had a report on about 22 countries now in Africa using virtual courts to ensure access to justice since the coronavirus pandemic happened. Um, and so it's, uh, it's important to see what would happen with technology and access to justice. We also have now freedom of assembly where more and more people are gathering online. Um, there are protests that I think have happened before on platforms such as Zoom, um, and so freedom of assembly, you know, has been enhanced by use of technology. We have, you know, um, protests now in Africa that are now mostly um, put together on, on online platforms. Also think on government accountability. Now we have, you know, um, a bit of progress on government accountability um, that have really benefited from the use of technology um, and operation of the laws. Um, on anti-discrimination as well, we have this, um, although more needs to be done, because as we know that um, artificial intelligence can actually, um, you know, um, even improve, it can actually add in more of biases and discriminatory practices, among other things. Next slide. So I thought to look at case studies on um, illustrating the impact of technology. Um, uh, as emancipatory. And we look at mobile phones. The use of mobile phones has been used to capture political violence in Sudan. Um, in 2013, this was one of the ways in which, you know, um, the, the political violence in Sudan sort of gained global, um, global attention and also got in crucial evidence. We also have the Bring Back Our Girls movement in Nigeria um, that really used on, you know, online platforms. And this was works to, you know, help the movement in bringing back the, the girls. That campaign, I think, is still ongoing, even at very, you know, sort of basic level. We also have the launch of virtual courts. Um, in 2020, according to our report, we have 22 countries in Africa that have established virtual court system that are seen access to justice, you know. And we also have the NSAS campaign in Nigeria, um, where you know ordinary citizens went into the streets and used Twitter to mobilize and Google Forms, for instance, to just get everybody together. Um, and through this social media, the catalyst, um, this really catalyzed the, the, the protest and had um, almost the entire country going out to, to protest. Next slide. So we, we um, appreciate that, you know, um, technology is lacking um, in terms of being an em em emancipator. Um, and so what, what's still left within the conference between law and technology? We still need to use more of legal analytics, you know, for instance, in criminal law um, that could be able to prevent, you know, crime um, and also just have some peace and order as a result of the use of technology. So technology is still lacking um, in improving this. We also have the use of government evaluation systems. Uh, we still are really lacking on, on this particular area. And so um, technology has not emancipated us in that particular sense. Um, we also have the third one on data oriented legislation. Uh, we still do not have you know, um, a critical mass and use of technology to ensure public participation in coming up with laws and just having more voices heard in the process of of governance. So I think we still have a long way to go 
you know, um, in looking at technology as an emancipator, um, you know, uh, within the, the legal ecosystem. And thank you. that for making the inputs complete to wrap up a bit what I found interesting in all your short presentations um, I think you all state or stated a problem that manifests inequality and the problem is that either private companies or the state controls data and technology and all in your own ways you try to circumvent or try to, um, yeah, I don't know, make technology a bit more freer from the control of um, state and private companies. Maybe you could um, shortly say something to it, like how, how is this control visible in your context and what, what is your action against it maybe? Maybe Georgia, would you start? Because I know that you don't have so much time. <laughs> Um, so what uh, I think, uh, since I already, I think we have a range of uh, ways we act, but uh, since I started already with, uh, with Bianca's video, I'll give an example um, as to memory as technology, so the right to memory. And um, so a lot of the, um, because um, a lot of and, you know, the, the slave people were brought, uh, um, a lot of them don't, don't know about the, you know, where do they come from, uh, like the, the, the past, uh, the ancestrality and the memory uh, has been erased. Uh, which is not, it's different from, for example, from, because Brazil is also a country of immigrants, but it's different, right? And my family, I am a third generation of a Lebanese immigrant in Brazil. But uh, I have, I know uh, more or less the story because, you know, they, they came uh, the, um, um, they came because they wanted, of course, they were running away from the Turks and, and for the war, but they came. And so I have a bit of access to my, my, my own family history, which is different, of course, from um, the slave people that were brought up uh, from the, the coast, uh, Benin and uh, Nigeria. Uh, and some other countries in the in the in the coast uh, of Africa, um, and um, so uh, the region that we act, the lab is in the Bay Area, is in the Santos, is in the, the port region, so it's the biggest port of Latin America, the port Santos port, and and there it's a um, as a metropolitan area of nine municipalities, um, and one of which uh, San Vicente. Is considered to be the first uh, village that was created by the Portuguese when they came, um, and that was, of course, uh, an area that had a, 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 the the, the indigenous they were living there before the Portuguese, right? So to be Guarani mostly in the coast area of the southeast, but they were also above. In anyway, um, and a lot of and, and there's a lot of uh, because it was the port. Uh, there's a lot of black history, you know, in that region, and that, that has been totally erased. Um, and nowadays, erased to a point where, like nowadays, Santos is considered uh, top five, I think it's the second or third of the most segregation city in terms of uh, geographical space. So where are the black people living and where is the white people living? So like white people are mostly living in the coast region and then uh, most of the black people are living uh, in the slums uh, and the stilts, we have uh, the biggest stilt slum there that is the of, uh, flooding water. And, uh, and then one of the projects, for example, that we run at the lab is um, um, the uh, memory technology and ancestrality project, which is um, uh, a mix of, you know, producing content and technology research and prototyping uh, to related to black uh, Black knowledge, you know, and the black population in that region. And this has already, I mean, we started this year and this has already a lot of impact in terms of retelling the story of a region, you know, like you've been there the whole, your whole life and you never knew 
anything, you know, it's not the official history. Uh, so, and, and the research is bringing a lot of documents of how, you know, black people are important to that region as being as architects or thinkers, intellectuals, engineers, and all these kind of things. Um, and also we're doing a, a circles of uh, learning journeys. So, you know, black audiovisual, black narratives, black design, you know, and all of these, we call it technology. And how are we involving this? So always keeping it open and interactive. So it's not a uh, closed. So we involve the whole community because in the lab, we work as with communities of practice, right? So we have a community of practice of memory and ancestrality, but we also have a community of practice of open technology and uh, free, free technologies. And we have, we have a, a community of practice of um, designers and art directors, for example, they're kind of all working together and uh, and learning together. And from that, we will have new prototypes, new technologies that are that they're going to be totally influenced by the access of knowledge that they now have and by, and by this collective thinking and access to memory. And so I think, um, I think this is a good example of what we say when we say about, you know, and and um and of course it's a important data is that uh, mostly the most uh, I really liked the, what Chin Mai brought the the you know we're we're already thinking about you know living in Mars and we're still trying to understand how we're going to have access to internet to people right to actually go to school in the pandemic which was a big problem in Brazil to to you know public students to ac have access to internet to 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 virtually go to school. And um, who who are the producers of uh, technology? You know uh, that are in the newspapers. You know and are g gaining money from startups and venture capitals. You know white male, medium high medium class people that had already uh, have you know uh, money in the family and etc. And these are these are considered like if you think about Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Jeff Be 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 Bezos, uh, all these all these ones that are dictating where technology is going. Look at them. Just look at their faces. Look at like what kind of lead and all these influences what we are living. You know all these. So that's a bit of the solutions and the actions that we uh, that we always combine with research and studying together, learning together, and then experimenting, prototyping, creating technology together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that Chidmai and Linda have also something to say to how money dictates tech um, and how there's a discrepancy between technology developers and their users, but also between technology developers and the investors, for example. How come that in our white investors um, almost fully invest into white founders and not into local founders? Or Chinmai has something to say that to diversity issues. I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> I mean, I could. So, um, but if you want to go, Linda, that's also fine. Okay, I was I was just gonna add on the on the founder issue that. Um, you know, they say that opportunity, that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. Um, and so we've seen, we know with technology, what, you know, what has happened. You know, we now have, you know, um, African founders, especially black founders coming in to innovate and have startups, um, but they don't have access to capital. And so capital is mostly white and male. Um, and so we have that technology hasn't actually fixed the, um, you know, the access to finance issue. And so you have a lot of this capital even coming in within Africa now, um, still taken back to the West. Um, if you look at the taxation regimes happening, um, digital taxation now is actually impacting African founders more than it's impacting founders from the global North. Um, because now you'd have governments now like Kenya and, and Uganda um, introducing social media tax, introducing digital taxation for online platforms, including things like Instagram, when people sell on those platforms. Um, but big tech companies such as Google, for instance, get exemptions under the free trade agreements 
Um, and so you would imagine that this tax would affect everybody or maybe would be, you know, a kind down local companies, but that's not happening. And so we have been convening discussions around, you know, um, black founders, white capital on how capital is white and founders are black um, and still they don't you know, benefit from, from this particular flow of, of capital. So I think that's one, you know, um, one instance where we could see the inequality brought about by technology. Um, and we haven't fully you know, discussed how artificial intelligence, for instance, um, still is gonna bring in this gap you know, across, across, I think, Africa and basically across the, the global South, that we are just going to be left out of this particular conversation on digitalization, um, the discussions around access to education. Now you need a device and that device is not your phone. You know, how are children going to access you know, um, education in the long term. And also on um, on different use of, of our taxes, you know, countries are having their taxes go into development and public digital goods um, on how you have more infrastructure that will benefit the public. Um, but you have countries such as ourselves in Kenya, where we don't consider these public digital goods. And so everybody's looking for their own infrastructure, including electricity, you know, that people are actually getting to sort out themselves um, by finding their own electricity or using solar, which is, should primarily be um, a government function, you know, in that particular sense. So I think technology has come into even further widen the digital divide. Yeah, to add to what Linda just said, uh, electricity and internet, two more, uh, two of the basic uh, necessities for building technology in itself. Uh, in a country like India, uh, this is again on the on the onus of people. So if there are uh, very few subscribers, you don't have the infrastructure. Nobody pitches in for the infrastructure, neither the government, nor the private se sector. Um, and nobody uh, pitches in for like electricity too. It, it's something that is so primary, even the devices, there's a huge gap between what uh, access to devices are in, even in my own country with urban and rural, rural if you look at it, uh, and if you go with like remote place, places and uh, uh, more accessible places, it's even worse. So that way, uh, the kind of investments that go in, are going into very small pockets of technology, not necessarily to support all forms of technology or all needs of technology. So that increases the divide in a sense. It does not reduce the divide uh, when you are only primarily investing in one new form of technology, which is also something that happens so that uh, it's not like if there are multiple people building it, they all get invested. Um, for example, let's say for privacy and security apps that we talk about, which are mostly used by human rights defenders around the world. I'm just speaking about a small domain and a small sector. Um, with here, a lot of European and American developers are invested or funded rather and they don't understand the needs of human rights defenders around the world. But then there is a small money associated with this and only one or two get the chance or the opportunity to get funded. This is the same for technology across different domains. Uh, you, once somebody gets funded or a few people get funded, it's hard for you to have diverse points of view or diverse way of building a technology because you don't uh, have that first access or the privilege of the first access, which increases the gap, which tends to like not listen to the other side, which tends to not become a place where they're inviting people to provide input. So it just increases the gap. Thank you very much. I think exactly this problem that there's no diversity at the beginning of technology development um, is also referring to Georgia's um, or the Pokomu approach to, to develop technology, whatever that is, if it's digital or not, from a community approach and, and collaboratively. Mm. 
Yeah, I would uh, I would wonder if you could um, delve more because I know in my you wrote a manual how to build tech um, more inclusive. How you, could you shortly just tell us something about this? <laughs> <laughs> it is more like a dummy's guide for like thinking about some obvious things when you are building tech. Um, I wrote it because as a technologist, there was no one who was uh, telling me what to look for, what to think about. Uh, but when I started working with communities, I realized there are certain things that you could uh, use as a framework. Ob obviously, just following the manual doesn't mean your uh, technology has everything that makes it inclusive or diverse, but it's just that uh, there are certain obvious things that you could do as a technologist, as a person who's building technology. Uh, that can be followed, like looking at certain checkpoints when you're designing, who you are including in your design team. Even the fact that who you're including in your teams uh, is something that people don't think about when they're building. They just build as one cohesive unit or one person and then go from there and start uh, thinking of how can they uh, build for different people. And that uh, is a problem there. So that's something that we wanted to uh, highlight, provide like a guideline for people to look at at different stages of building technology and look at what they can do, what are the steps they can proactively take in building technology. So this is as far as it can go. Uh, but from what uh, our experience says what Georgia says is right. You have to include the person who you're building the technology from the very beginning. And that person should have the lead in building that technology. That's when the inequalities reduce. Georgia, would you like to add something to it? I, I was just like <laughs> making sense of what you said myself. Um, yeah, I think. Uh... I don't know. I think uh, what Timai said is so true. And I, I'm really, I think it's also a mode uh, that I can relate to her a lot in terms of sharing our learnings. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't expect that we all know everything that we should be doing, but I do expect that we have a commitment to share our learnings and our mistakes as a part of also creating collective knowledge in 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 this um in this field you know i um i think that a lot of uh, techie people that uh, are open to it and i think i mean we are fighting or if you don't want to use uh, fight uh, metaphors but we are dealing with uh, really uh strong structures you know uh, that uh, are really dominant and uh, they have been there and they, and they, of course, they uh, they have a big, uh, a great uh, in intelligence and technology of pursuing um, and, and staying in the same place so that nothing changes. And that I'm so grateful that you know we have here uh, women that are uh, uh, acting in in, in, in several fields because I think law is essential in changing law and thinking about law and the and the role of law. And also the role of uh, technologists, as Ching Mai brings, also the role of uh, researchers like you, Alev. I think we all we need everything, uh, everybody, you know, uh, in this in this thinking. And um, and so just to say that at Procomun, we also create a lot of toolkits, just like Ching Mai, you know. I mean, because uh, there's no there's okay. So if you're doing something that we are learning by doing, um, so one of our main values is that we should also collect all this data and information and turn this into knowledge and that we can share um, and we share in Creative Commons. So in the, our website, we have a lot of methodologies and most of them, or maybe probably all of them are also bilingual Portuguese English or trilingual Portuguese English and Spanish. And um, and this and I, I have seen a movement in Brazil that is still, uh, you know, not so big, but uh, even uh, from funders, that you know uh, to give money that uh, I mean, for example, applications to only black uh, people or only black women, uh, you know, exclusive, or that only give money if you have uh, diversity on the board or or on the on the um, or on the team. 
So, I mean, I, I, I know it's not enough. Uh, we're talking about urgent matters. We're talking about the lives of the people, but uh, I have seen some change. So I'm not totally skeptical, although I, I am aware that the, it's a really big thing uh, that we are, we are dealing with uh, and they are really, they have power and money. So. Thank you. Maybe um, coming back to the law issue, <laughs> Linda, um, because I found interesting that we talked about erasure of knowledges, erasure of histories. Um, but I mean, in um, if I got it right, in the case of the Huduma Bill, there's also erasure of citizens or citizenship. Marginalized people get uh, erased by efforts of digital identification. Maybe you could explain that in the case of Kenya, Linda. Yeah, in, in the case of Kenya, we were trying to borrow from Chinmai's, um, you know, country. We wanted to bring in the um, digital identity system. So it's called Huduma number, which is like the R, the, I hope I can pronounce it well. Um, so the government has tried this. They did it, they introduced it last year um, in 2019. We had um, challenge, there was a challenge to it in court because what it did was that it introduced um, um, a law that you couldn't be able to access certain services, government services, without having this digital identity number. Um, so what has happened through the process is that the courts indicated they needed to have a data protection law, which they did not have. And two, that data should not be centralized um, because the data that they were bringing on board included DNA information, um, which we have seen in India. We have now DNA cloning, um, which is, is also not, not great for, for people's safety. Um, and so what um, the Nubians who are stateless people in Kenya went to court saying that this would further marginalize them from opportunities. Um, and we have seen what happens with uh, when government mandates something you can be able to attend school without that digital identity card. And that means that children would not actually get education. You can be able to access emergency health care. Um, our constitution in Kenya requires that, you know, you have a right to emergency health care. If you got an accident, then you need to be treated fast. Then they can ask about other questions later. But this actually meant that we also cannot access health care in that sense. Um, so I think Kenya would be a great point of learning for all of us that we should not use digital identity systems to further, um, you know, um, marginalize people and to further exclude them, even from the digital economy, because without a digital ID, you also not be able to, to, to trade. And so inclusive digital economies is really important to us. And that's why the lawyers have, we're really keen on policy issues. How do you have more inclusive policies that will ensure everybody gets on the digital train? Um, because otherwise it's gonna just be like 1980s and 1970s again, where just a few countries would achieve, you know, um, that fourth industrial revolution and not all of us achieve that, that, that particular industrial revolution. Thank you. Shenmai, I don't know if you have to add something as <laughs> Preferred country. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, Kenya did great uh, with the fight. Um, the kind, the insistence of data protection and the insistence of not uh, making it centralized was such an important decision for us. We suffered for uh, the lack of having those uh, restrictions, uh, the lack of. Um, enforcement in the country because there was a strong will for pushing it. So a lot of people suffered from it. So it was tie tied to our welfare schemes, which meant that if you are from a marginalized group, especially if you are below poverty line and you're trying to ac get access to food, uh, you have to have access to those digital ID systems and you are, able, you are supposed to authenticate through that. This also led to a lot of deaths uh, because they could not access food. So it has done a lot of harm in my country and I've seen it. It has done, um, brought about the discourse of citizenship and uh, we've been now fighting the issues of citizenship where we have also the next thing that's been brought in, which is NRC. Um, so which is also an ad additional registration of citizens uh, not that digital identity was good enough, 
because it was not good enough apparently so we have more um systems brought in just to marginalize people uh to also meet an end of religious religious extremism in in a very uh i would say not a straightforward way so that that's what is happening in my country so i would say linda congratulations to kenya for doing that honestly we still don't have a data protection bill and we have the nightmare of it going at this point so the importance of lawyers and the legal community working with the technology community is also very 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 much there without uh, the laws to support the technology we build we are not able to provide the protections that's what i would say uh, does someone of you want to refer to that because i just saw that the that the time is flying <laughs> and now do you want to say something to it again i was i was just going to agree that um we don't need to exclude lawyers from this conversation um and um my 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 thinking has been that you know uh, policies um around technology and innovation has been taken up by non lawyers for a long time because lawyers did not engage you know and so we have been encouraging them that you need to get on board and um ensure they are inclusive uh, policies and let the technologists do their work so that you're not doing human rights work when you could actually be innovating a little bit more um and so um i hope that you know lawyers across just get on board uh, figure out what your tech ecosystem needs and stand up for them and let them be peaceful enough to innovate because i think people innovate more when they are more peaceful and they're not fighting this this wars that lawyers should fight thank you i think before i wrap up our session i would ask you or each of you to make a short statement what yeah how do you see the double edged sword technology um so what is the conclusion maybe or is there any conclusion <laughs> Well um I I don't I don't see any conclusions but uh I I just uh I have been thinking while listening to all of you is that uh even though you know we are living really hard times um I I really appreciate that we are many also and we are looking at it from different standpoints and points of view and uh and I think at Procomu uh, and me personally we are always looking at you know um how can we turn this into a unlearning journey as well as a learning journey so what kind of things do we have to unlearn in order to you know create innovative ways but uh, innovation coming from citizen uh, or of or person uh, uh equality right uh, so um I like a lot uh, like what Spivak says about uh privilege and how it insulates you and it's a form of ignorance as well. And I think that uh, the tech industry is super super insulated and totally disconnected from, you know, or I mean, in sometimes consciously disconnected of uh of of the world needs and uh that we need more people on 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 this uh you know putting our head to work and and creating solutions so just uh, thank you and uh hoping that we meet soon again also to exchange more this i learned a lot today thank you <laughs> so uh, as much as tech is important it's also important we have the right check, checks and balances uh which means that not only technologists have to be involved everybody has to be involved um and technologists should not be of one kind uh technologists should come from every community and we have to support that how we're going to make that happen is upon us um that's the effort that we need to put in um i say we um i i say me because i think that i we come from at least me i come from a relatively privileged 
position and I should be putting that effort to support people who could come into tech and make the difference. Uh, that's on all of, all of us. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, technology, there is a lot of potential for it to be emancipatory, but at this point, we are letting it be driven by somebody's greed or motive. Um, and uh, that needs to change. How it changes is a big question, but whatever effort we can to put to stop it from being driven by greed or motive is important. And we need to continue to do that. That's what I would say. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think for me, I would want to say that um, you should not leave anyone behind. That if we don't leave anyone behind, then technology will be emancipatory. That um, we will think through who, who are we not having on the table? Who does not have access to internet? Who does not have access to data? Um, who does not have access to public digital goods? I think that conversation would ensure that we all at some basic level, you know, how we talk about basic universal, universal income. We need to talk about basic access, that what does basic access mean um, and basic access to technology. I think that's the conversation we need to have and then we get people on board. Um, and also too, that we need to partner, we need to cross collaborate between disciplines um, and between continents as well and see what, what drawings could we have from each other, what exchange, including policy exchange, can we have with each other and ensure that um, you know, we have laws that are inclusive and that get more people on the digital economy um, and also to bridge the digital divide. Thank you. Thanks for your closing words. <laughs> it was really uh, an insightful conversation and for me it would have gone or it would be cool to have a longer discussion about it. Um, but to sum up briefly what I gained from, uh, from our conversation is that uh, technology is anything but a neutral tool. It is political. Technology is political. And um, yeah, therefore, as you all said, technology in general or technology development in specific is ambivalent. So on the one side, technology can create emancipatory spaces like the inclusion of marginalized people be they marginalized by the state, colonial knowledges, patriarchy. But exactly these oppressive systems, they also represent the danger of technologies. For example, um, when technology implemented to achieve security of citizens turns into the ability for the state to control citizens even more, or um, when um, investment in technology development excludes local startups, or when mostly male and white tech developers build technologies for others. So these are the dangers which reproduces uh, or reproduce the same structures of oppression, I would say. Um, so that means tech for good has not always a social impact or a good one. And I think you showed that um, yeah, practices like claiming the right for data, the importance for diversity and local knowledges is a way out, but technology can't be the only device, can't be the only solution. Um, there must be, as you all emphasized, transdisciplinary collaboration, um, unlearning oppressive structures, forcing us to unlearn them, but also for the minority world to critical, be critical about the whiteness, for example, their privileges. Uh, yeah, so I think you all made the claim for community-based solutions and collaboration. So I really want to thank you three to, uh, yeah, to, that you took your time to share your experience and your knowledge. So thank you very much, Georgia and Shenmai and Linda. Yeah, and I hope to see each other soon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you thank very much. You. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye.